We simply cannot allow people to pour into the United States undetected, undocumented, unchecked. And complete the dang fence. This bill that we will sign today is not a revolutionary bill. Cast down your bucket where you are. We come from France. And I am, you know, adamantly against illegal immigrants. They're coming in by the thousands. Just unbelievable. A Deal. wall is an immorality. What are you rooting for? Those masters of the universe are at it again. You maniac! You blew it up! Welcome to Parsing Immigration Policy, the podcast of the Center for Immigration Studies. My name is Mark Krikori, an executive director of the Center. And uh, this is the first podcast of 2024. What we're going to do is look back at the year just ended, 2023. We did a kind of retrospective at the turn of the uh, previous year. And so we're doing something similar. And with us to talk about it are two of our analysts, John Fury and Todd Benzman, who deal with different areas of this issue. Todd writes especially about the border, and John studies interior enforcement issues. And so we'll start with the big story of, is the border and all of the things that stem from that and all the things that are related to that. And the first thing I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that one of the things that happened in 2023 was that Todd published his second book, Overrun, How Joe Biden Unleashed the Greatest Border Crisis in U.S. History, which is obviously still available at Amazon and absorbed a lot of Todd's time, not just in writing it, but in this year in promoting it. So the border is the big story and the basic numbers there. We're not going to go over everything, but that in fiscal year 2023, which ended October 1st, but in fiscal 2023, there were 3.2 million encounters, so-called, of inadmissible aliens. These are border patrol arrests or people who show up at ports of entry but have no right to come here. That's double the 2019 number, which was the last fiscal year that was fully non-COVID. So this is, uh, you know, despite the current press secretary's assertions that there's really nothing different going on at the border. The Homeland Security Secretary has said that the border is secure. We actually have double the number of illegal immigrant encounters. And that's not southern border, that's also northern border, ports of entry, everything. And to flesh out the calendar year of 2023, there are more than 600,000 more illegal immigrant encounters in October and November. And December, the number hasn't been released yet officially, but it's been reported by Fox News and others that it was well over 300,000, the highest month ever recorded. So this issue is, you know, not going anywhere. There's a quote that really tees up the rest of this discussion well. In March 2023, Judge Wetherell in Florida issued a ruling in the case Florida v. U.S. relating to one aspect of the administration's policies of releasing illegal immigrants. And the quote starts, quote, the evidence establishes that defendants have effectively turned the southwest border into a meaningless line in the sand and little more than a speed bump for aliens flooding into the country, unquote. So, Todd, let's start with you. Over the past year, have we seen the border be little more than a speed bump and a meaningless line in the sand? Well, first of all, uh, Happy New Year. And man, that was one busy 2023. And the short answer to that is absolutely the border, they say, you know, there's, that there is no open border. It's not an open border. It is the definition of an open border, in my opinion. This whole thing really kind of starts in 2022 when the administration was ginning up the expiration and for the expiration of Title 42, which, as you know, and, and a lot of us know, is the pandemic era health measure that required the instant expulsions of all illegally crossing immigrants and to deny them the ability to claim asylum, just return them back to Mexico. Well, the intelligence community in 2022 was predicting, if you recall, 
numbers on a daily basis ranging from 12,000 a day to as high as 18,000 a day, 14,000 a day, 15,000 a day sort of numbers. And the intelligence community figures really spurred the administration to put in place a lot of new policies. And when Title 42 actually ended, which was in May, May 11th. Yeah, there were, there were legal challenges and fits and starts. It was going to end, and then it, it didn't end, and that sort of thing. Then we saw the realization of those intelligence community estimates, which have come true, especially in the last months, or you could say the, the, the last months of, of calendar 2023, right? or maybe the first months of fiscal 2024, however you want to put it. But I would say that the demise of Title 42 had to have been one of the most influential events to occur on the U.S. southern border because the numbers of immigrants that began coursing through just in anticipation of the end of this, that nobody was going to catch them in return, that they were pretty much all probably going to get in, that the odds went, went sky high, the needle went to, into deep green, that you were going to get in. Right. And stay in after that. And so we saw the numbers move to now 14,000 a day, just like the intelligence community reported would happen. Although it did take longer than expected because, you know, the numbers were really blowing up before the end of kind of in anticipation of the end of Title 42. Because if you just got bounced back, there were no consequences. But the prospective illegal aliens and the smugglers did sort of have a little bit of a wait and see because the administration was saying, we're going to get tough. And so the numbers actually went down a little bit from their stratospheric heights right after Title 42. In June, the numbers were lower, right? Right. There were a couple of things that were going on there. I mentioned that, you know, the administration put together some new policies to try to contend with what the intelligence community said was going to happen. Right. And a couple of those policies had to do with kind of allowing hundreds of thousands of intending border crossers to, as you like to say, and I like to say now too, to (laughs) schedule their illegal crossings through a phone app called CBP-1 that allows them to, you know, with approval in Mexico or elsewhere, cross a land port. In other words, a legal port of entry and then be let in and let go. That's right. And so those numbers, those policies went into play really in an expanded way in January of 2023. Very, very significant because as we know now from our FOIA requests, a minimum of 500,000 came through that way. And so whatever numbers they were reporting crossing illegally between ports of entry and they were claiming um, victory and running laps and everything is somewhat mitigated by the fact that they just transitioned those entries to another kind of entry and called it something, you know, counted it under a different category. Right. But total, and they're still doing that even now. Right. But we are still seeing all year long, especially since May, we're still seeing the number of people crossing illegally, just blowing off the CBP-1 app, absolutely escalate and stare step climbing fashion right, from right. you know 7000 a day 8000 a day to you know 14000 and i think we're we we've seen a 15000 or we will shortly as of this recording and i think the intelligence community estimates of 18000 are very realistic that we in 2024 will start to see those kind of days as well so between the demise of Title 42 and the implementation of these pre-scheduled crossings. You can fly in, too. There are six or seven different nationalities are allowed to fly from foreign airports directly into U.S. airports. Right. And we have to count those on top of everything else so that whatever numbers they're reporting as crossing between ports of entry have to be regarded as lesser than the actual total 
a number of foreign sure. nationals that are entering the United States. And so 2023 was an incredible banner year. And one last thing that I would point out about 2023 is in the beginning and in 2022, the administration was promising all these draconian, Trumpian-esque kinds of policies. We're going to do expedited removal. We're going to be deporting people. We're going to do fast track asylum claim adjudications right. and move people back out. And within a week or two of the, the end of Title 42, I went down to the border and saw for myself that they weren't doing any of that at all. Right. Yeah. And so they never did any of, they never did any of that. We ended up with, I want to say they're, they're claiming in the, their most recent ICE report, 142,000 actual removals for the fiscal year not really breaking that down. We don't really know what those are, but clearly it's not nearly enough to act as a deterrent on illegal border crossings. Those numbers are just incredible. We're watching right. something historic happen down there again. I have some other border things I wanted to talk to, but since you brought up the ICE report about removals, John, this is your area. So what happened last year with removals by ICE, ICE deals with illegal immigrants already in the country as opposed to Border Patrol and the rest of CBP that deals with mostly just at the border. There was a report recently about their activities. What's going on, the administration's claim has always been that the Trump administration was just wasting time chasing after ordinary illegals, and that meant there wasn't the focus on the really bad guys, the criminals that needed to be focused on. Is that what the ICE uh, data shows or not? No, it does not, as predicted. You know, the Biden administration did claim for three years and continues to claim that they're focusing on the worst of the worst, I guess inferring that the Trump administration was not going after criminal aliens. Right. But in reality, what happens when you arrest large numbers of illegal aliens, you tend to arrest large numbers of criminal aliens at the same time. It's, it's something that this administration either doesn't appreciate, doesn't understand, or doesn't want to understand. Or, in reality, they had always planned to gut immigration enforcement. And the way they've been doing it is by claiming that they're narrowing their focus on criminal aliens, hoping that that's enough to get the media off their backs or to placate people who want to see our immigration laws enforced. But their own data show that, in fact, the numbers of arrests and removals of criminal aliens are down dramatically. And I'll give you some numbers here. And just to point out, this report that just came out, ICE produces an annual report every year. Usually it gets released at the beginning of December. It's for the previous fiscal year. So this is for 2023 fiscal year data. This administration decided to release the report on a Friday afternoon, the last calendar day of the year, right after Christmas, right before New Year's, no press conference, no opportunity for media to ask questions. And that's probably because the results are not good. And I'll give you a few different numbers here. What I decided to do was look at the last three years, fiscal years of the Biden administration, 2021, 2022, and 2023, and compare them to the first three years of the Trump administration, 2017, 18, and 19. And here's the results. There's been a 57% decrease in arrests of criminal aliens. There's been a 68% decrease in at-large arrests of criminal aliens. At-large arrests are basically operational type arrests where ICE goes out and locates aliens in our communities, as opposed to a, a custodial transfer arrest where a local sheriff has arrested a criminal alien for some sort of local crime and then transfers that alien to ICE custody for removal. Right. ICE gets a lot of arrests through that process, of course, but the at-large arrests are down 68% because ICE isn't going out and doing operations like they should be. Right. There's been a 44% decrease in detainer requests issued on criminal aliens. These are the requests that ICE issues to sheriff's departments that have arrested criminal aliens, saying, please transfer them to our custody when you're done processing them for their criminal records. Well, they're not even trying to take custody of a lot of these people. It's down 44%. Deportations of criminal aliens are down 67%. And as far as immigration-related criminal prosecutions, this is where ICE and DOJ work together to prosecute aliens 
for various immigration crimes, like reentry crimes, things like that. That's down 55%. So the message, as Todd mentioned a moment ago, that people are hearing is that once you make it into the United States, your odds of being prosecuted, arrested, removed are much lower than they have been in the past. And of course, that's contributing to people arriving at our border in large numbers. Right. To go back now to sort of some of the consequences of the Biden administration policy, Todd, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what Texas is doing, because Texas seems to be the, well, is the border state that is trying to make up to the degree possible for the Biden administration's unwillingness to enforce immigration laws. And this year, several things interesting happened in this regard. They started to put concertina wire on the riverbank to keep people from being able to get in. They did a, um, these floating barriers in the Rio Grande to stop people from even getting across the river. And uh, there's been some sort of butting of heads where Border Patrol has been sometimes cutting the wire that Texas put up. And usually Border Patrol and Texas law enforcement work pretty well together. This seems to be creating a kind of irritant. So to put this into context, Texas sued the federal government. And in June of 2023, the Supreme Court issued a ruling, the effect of which is that basically says states are not allowed to sue the feds, even if the feds are obviously violating the law and not doing their job. So just a little bit on what is Texas doing? And you've written some about this island that they took over to, on the border, on the river to try to stop illegal crossings. Right. Well, 2023 also brought us a federal state showdown that we haven't right. seen in a really long time because, you know, Republican Governor Greg Abbott, he's had Operation Lone Star out there for three years now which is, you know, a lot of drug interdiction and uh, traffic policing and looking for human smugglers on the Texas side, but not rounding up immigrants or anything, or really doing anything that presents a significant deterrence until Title 42 ended in May. And then they brought in a tactic that was new and different and interesting, which was to block, stop, and deter immigrants at the riverbank, kind of like NFL linemen, you know, <laughs> on the scrimmage line, right? And, you know, if you're, you're, you're wading across and you try to come up the riverbank, you've got these big burly guys just simply locking arms behind barbed wire or concertina, sea wire, really, and just not letting them in. And that proved to be really effective and popular, I'll, I'll add, politically for the uh, Texas governor in Matamoros right at the moment of the expiration of Title 42, when just thousands and thousands of immigrants were rushing across to get in before these supposedly draconian new Biden policies that never materialized, they pretty much shut it down in the Matamoros sector, that area down there. Which is South Valley. Texas, all, South the way, Texas. all the way down in South Texas, yeah. And then they expanded it in the Del Rio sector which was kind of up and coming. We've, we've seen that happen. A lot of illegal immigrants by the thousands, 5,000 a day coming across there. They, they did expand it and militarized hundreds, thousands of yards of Texas border and did Operation Hold the Line. That's what they call it there. But they, you know, were at in interesting loggerheads with the federal border patrol agents under Mayorkas who then began cutting the wire, cutting the Texas wire, or worse, bringing forklifts in right in front of the Texas troopers and lifting the wire up and letting all the immigrants in. Because, you know, once they take, hold, take custody of these immigrants, then they just process them into the country in about 24 hours. They're all in. And so this has been going on so much in Texas that finally the immigrants just overwhelmed whatever vestiges of tactical policy that Texas was trying it, it down there. And they were just completely swamped. Now there's really very little that Texas is doing or can do because they're just absolutely swamped, overrun themselves. But 2023 was very interesting in that a state was really trying 
all sorts of different things to new things, including closing commerce with Mexico by doing truck inspections, 100% truck inspections. They did that quite often all through 2023 for two, three, four days at a time, backing truck traffic uh, into Mexico 10, 20 miles until the Mexicans cried uncle and would start rounding up immigrants for a while and deporting them to the south. And so really you've just had this push-pull federal state conflict all through 2023. I don't really know whether 2024 will bring us a lot more of that, but the, I guess, conflict extends into courtrooms as well over all kinds of different tactics. And one of the areas that conflict is going to happen in a courtroom, and that's going to be this year, is a law that Texas passed this, you know, in 2023 to authorize arrests of illegal immigrants for having illegally entered Texas. And so, you know, the usual suspects are going to sue saying that Texas doesn't have the authority for that. So we're going to see in this year a continuation of this conflict between the states and the feds over whether whether the states are even allowed to try to enforce immigration laws or enforce the border in general if the feds don't want to. Right. And this is this is definitely going to be worth watching because for a couple of reasons. But one thing that we have to keep in mind, you know, Texas has been sort of ground zero, a major epicenter for the mass migration crisis for three years running. But if Texas ever does find true success and, you know, finds the right the perfect cocktail of ingredients where everything kind of works, you still have the problem of Arizona, right. which has sprung massive leaks of, I wouldn't even call it leaks. I mean, just absolute, you know, fire hose flooding of illegal immigration over the Arizona border. So we have to kind of keep in mind the broader context, which is that you still have California and Arizona and New Mexico right. even to a certain extent that really underscores the fact that this is a illegal immigration and border security really is a federal problem because yeah of course yeah so i mean just kind of something to keep in mind as texas continues on with the things that it's trying you've got a huge number crossing in into places in arizona i think they're still coming through yuma but the lukeville area and you've got Lots coming over the California border as well. Right. Although the interesting thing is, you know, California is the farthest away if you're coming through Mexico. So in se- in a sense, it, it, it's intuitive that people would, you know, would try South Texas because it's so much closer, even though it's still far, still a thousand miles, but it's a thousand miles closer th- if you're coming through Mexico. But the interesting thing is if you're going to Arizona, and they are in huge numbers, you know, California is getting an increase, there's no question. But my sense is, and I don't know how much of this is sort of, I guess this is sort of half tongue in cheek, but only half, is that not only are people who live in California trying to leave, but even the illegal aliens aren't all that interested in going to California. (laughs) Because (laughs) just as Californians are all moving to Texas, the illegal aliens are picking Texas over California. Anyway, another effect, John, of all of this disaster inside the United States, in other words, not right at the border, that we saw developments on in 2023 is uh, basically the issue of illegal immigrant kids. And that there's two things that came that were sort of noticeable. One is that it was reported that the Biden administration, specifically the Health and Human Services Department, lost some 85,000 unaccompanied minors. In other words, they followed up on them in a very superficial way just by calling the sponsors Nobody picked up the phone, and so they were like, oh, well, okay, and they just moved on to the next thing. They have no idea what happened to these kids. And one of the things that happened to some of them, at least, and this was reported by the New York Times of all places in um, a series of stories they started publishing in February, was the exploitation of minors, you know, child labor, basically. There are kids working in roofing and in um, dangerous factories. And I'm not, we're not even talking just about like 17-year-olds who were basically working age in the countries they come from, but kids much younger, 11, 12, 13-year-old kids working in very dangerous conditions. So what's the story on those, uh, those issues, John? 
Well, this was, of course, entirely predictable as well, because under the Obama-Biden administration, when Mayorkas was deputy secretary of DHS, there was a large influx of UACs, unaccompanied alien children, coming across the border. And we started seeing them being exploited at work sites across the country. Right. The Senate Investigations Committee did a whole report on this, just a scathing report of how Health and Human Services and DHS were, were dealing with these kids. And one of the organiza- one of the agencies that came to the rescue, of course, was ICE. They uncovered through a worksite operation, through a trafficking investigation, they uncovered a number of kids working at, for example, an Ohio egg farm, which became a sort of a, a, a central story. Kids working 12 hours a day, being locked in trailers, harvesting eggs. Well, that was a, an opportunity for Congress to demand some changes in, in practices from HHS and DHS shortly thereafter the Trump administration comes in and we recognized that that was a problem and started to to try to clean it up and one of the things that we did was assist HHS in doing background checks on these sponsors most of whom were just random illegal aliens coming from somewhere in the US down to the border to pick up a kid that had come across the border well HHS doesn't have the capacity to do background checks all that well. They're not a criminal focused agency. They're not a law enforcement agency. They don't understand you know, immigration status or anything like that. So we started providing background checks and very quickly in a funding bill, the Congress put an end to that and said that in most instances, ICE could not arrest the sponsors. We were previously. And I think that was contributing to um, you know, putting an end to some of this this trafficking of, of kids to our border. But through a funding bill, the Congress stopped that largely because of a proposal that was written by none other than Senator Kamala Harris at the time. And the result was that there was an uptick in kids being trafficked to the border and an increase in complaints going to the HHS hotline about kids being exploited. And then as soon as the Biden administration shows up, well, they put an end to worksite investigations almost entirely. They are not arresting sponsors like we were under the Trump administration. And the natural expectation is that we're going to see large numbers of kids being exploited at worksites. And that's exactly what we are seeing. And as you point out, the New York Times has done some amazing reporting on this. But the problem with the New York Times is that they can do the who, what, when, and where, but not the why. They won't tell you why this is happening. They right. can't bring themselves to say that. And the reason is because of the policies of this administration. And in fact, one of the data points that just came out in this ICE in the view report shows that in 2019, fiscal year 2019, there were 6,351 removals of unaccompanied children. Last year, only 212. Wow. In 2020, only 220. Just a dramatic cut in the number of UACs that are being returned home. Well, what is the effect of that? You're not doing worksite enforcement. You're not sending kids back. Guess what the result's going to be? It's going to be large numbers of kids coming across the border, and those kids are going to be exploited. That's the legacy of this administration. And it's interesting that there's sort of a parallel here with the next story I wanted to talk about, which is that, you know, the who, what, where and how is something that even institutions that are, you know, not hawkish on immigration, let's put it that way, are willing to talk about, but not the why. And that's the next thing I want to talk about is this busing issue of uh, illegal immigrants being sent to big cities. Uh, and it kind of, the part of it that gets everybody's attention is Texas's program of giving people free bus trips if they want it to New York City and also to other places, to Chicago and to D.C. And the parallel, I think, here is that they realize it's a problem. Political leaders of these cities, all of them Democrats, all of them sanctuary cities, but the why, in other words, the, the, the root cause this is happening, the policies of, the, of their own party's administration in Washington, is something they're not willing to talk about. And, you know, this the migrant crisis in New York is sort of the one that everybody focuses on because that's where all the media is based. And so that's what gets the attention. It really started in 2022 with busing people when Governor Abbott in Texas started this. 
And initially, and even now still, the mayors of these cities are blaming Abbott, and this is an evil thing by Texas and all that, but only a tiny fraction of the border-jumping illegal immigrants coming to these cities are actually being bussed there by Texas. But it was in September of 2022, or three rather, that the issue got so bad that Mayor Adams of New York went beyond just asking for more money from Washington, which is the kind of the first reaction of a lot of these big city mayors is not to criticize the policy, but just say they need more taxpayer money to fund it. In September, Mayor Adams said, quote, this issue will destroy New York City, unquote. And that, you know, seems to me a significant escalation, even though he still hasn't reached the point of calling for actual concrete changes at the border. Any thoughts on, you know, if you think these big city mayors will actually get to the point of openly challenging their own administration in Washington and saying, you have to change border policies, immigration policies, in order to stop this flow rather than just say, give us more money. Any thoughts on that? I have a couple of thoughts about that. One is that, you know, 2023 saw the, I'd say, open rebellion in major American cities of permanent generational Democratic constituencies against their party over this issue. Go Google, you know, any Chicago assembly meeting, you know, a city council meeting, and you'll see these rooms packed to the rafters with extremely angry black community leaders upset at seeing the city divert you know, $50 million a month, hundreds of millions of dollars for housing subsidies and food and clothing and medical and everything for illegal immigrants that are coming to Chicago when they've been demanding for 50 years, even tiny fractions of that amount, and they are mad. I mean, you can watch these videos. That's in one city, but that's happening in all of these cities where they're just flat right. out coming straight out saying, we are not voting Democrat. We're voting Republican next time over this. So I think that that story has real legs and muscular legs for the 2024 national elections. It'll be something to definitely watch the polling on that. Because, you know, our national elections now, especially for the White House, you know, they're razor thin margins and it doesn't right. take much to swing one of those elections one way or another. And, this issue of you know the border crisis is one of those issues that's always been in the top two or three, and there's polling out there showing it that it that it's even moved moving above the question of inflation in the country and just basic you know pocketbook issues. So right. that's something to watch. And the other thing I would mention is it's really disingenuous of these mayors to blame Greg Abbott for you know, bussing all these people in, a governor is unable legally or practically or logistically to force immigrants onto buses. These are all people that were going to go to Chicago, New York, et cetera, on their own anyway. Right. Greg Abbott just facilitated their transportation by offering freebie, you know, passage. So free passage. And in any case, the numbers that he's allowing to board buses for free are, you know, fractional compared to the total number that are just buying bus tickets and going there and have been for three years straight, two years before right. Abbott ever even bothered to do that. That whole thing is just always mischaracterized. Abbott's not bussing anybody. He's just giving free passage to people who were going to buy tickets anyway. Right. Yeah. The interesting thing is, when that was uh, that program was announced, which is now I think it was in 2022 when they started doing that, I wasn't against it, but I was kind of skeptical it would make much difference. It was called a stunt, and you know politics is partly theater anyway, and so you know stunts are fine. I just didn't think it would work. But man, oh man, 2023 showed that was the most effective political theater 
ever. Any thoughts, John, on the busing issue before we get to our last topic? Yeah, one additional thought on that. I mean, I think it is a nice thing to see the sanctuary governors and mayors raising the immigration issue and being very frustrated by what they're seeing. I think that deep down they understand, as Todd mentioned, these people are coming across the border and they have to go somewhere. And they are going to go to New York. They are going to go to Virginia. They're going to go to Maryland. They're going to go to all these different states. Right. But what, what actually kind of bothers me a little bit, though, is that I'm only seeing, with the exception of Texas, sanctuary mayors really raising this issue. You know, bring it back to the kids being exploited. They're, these UACs are being exploited at work sites all across the country in a number of different states, including red states. And one of the most recent New York Times pieces was focused on a kid who had his arm basically shredded off at a meatpacking plant in Virginia. Right. Now, what bothers me is that I haven't heard much of anything out of any Republican legislator in Virginia or the Republican governor. You know, why isn't the Republican governor of Virginia, Yunkin, saying, I want to see ICE doing worksite investigations in my state immediately. I want to see ICE operations removing every illegal alien in my state. My state is a, a magnet for illegal immigration. We know this to be true. A lot of Central Americans make their way to Northern Virginia. Other governors like Yunkin could be calling for ICE to do more. And instead, we're just watching these politicians from Chicago and New York make these demands. I think we need to see a little more out of the Republican leadership in the state. No, it's an interesting point because even when Republican politicians, and obviously there are a lot of exceptions, but even when Republican politicians are criticizing what's happening at the border, they're just focusing on the border rather than drawing the connection that is obvious that what happens at the border and what happens inside the country are related. I mean, you can't have lax policies inside the country and not deport anybody and not do any interior enforcement, et cetera, and think that somehow border enforcement is going to pick up the slack and fix the problem. So anyway, our last specific issue and development I wanted to talk to in looking back at 2023, and this is something that's ongoing, is the fight over the Ukraine supplemental funding bill. And I'm not sure if you're not in Washington, you follow this super closely, but it's a very important issue. President Biden submitted a bill not to fund the whole government, but for extra money to send to Ukraine and also lesser amounts to Taiwan and Israel. But the White House included in that a request for extra border funding. And that gave the Republicans an opening to say, okay, you know, we're for all of this stuff, but if you don't change policies, the border funding is just going to be used to wave illegal immigrants into the country even faster. And so the Republicans, even though they only have one half of one branch of the government, are using their leverage to try to extract policy changes from this administration. And the Democrats have resisted. Republicans have so far held firm and no deal was struck before they left town for the holidays, and they're going to come back this month and continue to deal with it. You know, this is going to be an interesting fight to see whether the changes Republicans are demanding, basically they're demanding that a bill called HR2, which the House passed in May, and has a lot of border-related measures in there, closing loopholes. You know, I mean, it, it's not a magic bullet that will do everything, but it's probably the best enforcement bill we've seen passed by either House of Congress in many, many years, whether they're going to hold the line and insist on that. Any thoughts on what's going to happen with that or, um, you know, how's that likely to work out? Well, I'm, I'm always skeptical of, you know, deals like this. I think that what we should look for in any deal that does get struck is let's say the administration comes back and says, okay, we'll make this, that, and the other concession. We'll start doing this, that, and the other, and um, it'll be really Trumpian. Then they'll cut the deal. The money will you know, go out to the Ukrainians and whatever, but then there'll be loopholes and they'll find ways to just really not meet the letter of the deal and the money, you know, went through, but not the policy. And I think we've right, seen right. this over and over again. And that's kind of what worries me about this, that there'll be no, nothing meaningful 
remember that when Title 42 went away, it was replaced by this whole suite of really tough sounding. We're going to expedite removal and we're going to do all these streamlined things and nobody's going to take advantage of us after this. But they didn't do any of that. They blew it all off immediately. Right. Are you, uh, John, are you similarly optimistic about what's likely to happen on HR2? Well, last year during one of these podcasts, I made a prediction that during this past year, Congress would be way too focused on border security related bills, which even though HR2 is great, it's largely border security focused. There's not much interior enforcement in it. Right. And I predicted that it wouldn't go anywhere anyhow, and that we'd continue to see large increases in illegal immigration during 2023, which means I'm either a long lost descendant of Nostradamus <laughs> or the politics of immigration have just gotten way too predictable in Washington, D.C. I think it's the latter. But my prediction for this coming year is a little bit different because it is an election year. And I think that quietly, the White House does want some sort of an immigration bill they can point to, to say, look, we understand there's a problem, and that's why we proudly signed whatever the bill is going to be ultimately named. Right. But <laughs> if the Republicans aren't smart, that will give Biden a political win, at least on paper, but it won't have any actual impact on the illegal immigration coming across the border. That's the worst case scenario. Right. That's what I think might happen. There may be some good things and whatever gets passed, but I, I actually am a little more optimistic about something coming out of Congress this year. Okay. Well, that's interesting because that's where I wanted to end with his predictions. And I uh, listened to your predictions from last year and the end of 2022 about what was going to happen in 2023. And the parts that jumped out at me were, it's not going to be pretty. And you said, it's not ending anytime soon. So I think you were pretty on the uh, mark there. And Frankly, honestly, it's sort of like what your prediction was now. A uh, couple of the other predictions, we had Art Arthur and Jessica Vaughn last year doing the retrospective for 2022. And uh, Art was, he said he was kind of bullish on the use of appropriations power by the Republicans in the House to get change. And that hasn't really happened, but that's what this fight over the Ukraine funding bill is about. And his other point was that oversight activity would be significant. And we have, in fact, over 2023 seen in the House, the Homeland Security Committee, the Judiciary Committee, and the Oversight Committees all issuing reports in a sense, both to just get the information out generally, but also to lay the groundwork for the impeachment of Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas. We'll see if that comes to fruition. And Jessica had predicted more action at the state level, which again, we have, we have seen in 2023. So I don't have a sort of earth-shaking prediction myself, but Todd, if you have anything you want to predict for, for this coming year, we'd love to hear it. And then we'll uh, either praise or embarrass you uh, both <laughs> and myself at the, at the end of the year when we do a retrospective for 2024. So any thoughts, Todd? Well, I won't be surprised if we see the intelligence community's prediction come true of 18,000 days, 18,000 days, if if they're not going to detain and deport at the border and at the interior in significant numbers, we're going to see this border crisis go all the way through to the end of, of 2024 in ever higher escalating numbers all the way through. I would predict that, that 2024, and I don't see anything like that actually happening. I'm not optimistic. So I think 2024 is going to be the next new greatest record-breaking number of crossers in American history. And I do think, though, that there is a, a pretty good chance, a better chance than in the midterm elections 2022, that electorally this issue will actually cut, and it'll cut deeply against the Democratic Party. Uh, that's a big prediction um, that maybe. You know, the Republicans will take the White House on this narrow, thin margin that, they, that they're developing over this issue. Because unlike in 2022, the interior of America is really feeling this and seeing it before their eyes. Whereas in 2022, still kind of not so much. 
and you're seeing media coverage increasing, you can't avoid it in all of these big cities. So I think I'm hoping or, you know, that, that, that I'm right on that, but maybe not, maybe not. Yeah. So, uh, and just to be clear, you know, we didn't give context to this, you know, 10 or 12 or 14 or even 18,000 potentially illegal immigrants each day. The context for that, I think, because what does that mean? You know what? Uh, but the, 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 it's important to understand that Obama's Homeland Security Secretary, Jay Johnson, who, uh, you know, was a, a fairly serious person doing his job. In other words, he was actually trying to do it. He has said that when he was secretary, if there were 1,000 illegal immigrant crossings in a day, you know, if he got up in the morning and read the reports and it was 1,000 for the previous day, that was a bad day. That strained their capacity to deal with the border. And we're now routinely for the past several years, been talking about five, six, seven thousand a day. In December, we've been seeing ten, twelve, even fourteen thousand a day. So, I mean, this really is unprecedented stuff. So, let me end with my predictions. I have two predictions, and again, people will be feel free to embarrass me about this. I'm sort of have the opposite idea from what John said about this, you know, funding deal and immigration security. I think. It's not impossible that there will simply be no deal because, and the, and the important thing here is the funding fight that is going on now, started last year, will continue this month, is not about shutting the government down. That's always been the issue and Republicans always lose those fights because the media makes it seem as though they're the ones at fault, even though both parties you know, are if they don't compromise, they're the reason the government shut down. This isn't about shutting the government down. This is about funding foreign countries. And whatever the relative merits or demerits of sending money to, to Ukraine and Taiwan and Israel, it doesn't have the same resonance or salience. So the Republicans so far have stood firm in insisting on these policy changes. And I'm just not sure the Democrats can give away enough to satisfy the Republicans. So my first prediction is, I don't think there will be a funding deal. I think it's just not just not going to happen. And the other thing is, and this is election related, and let me put in the disclaimer here that the center is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We don't engage in electioneering or anything like that, but we observe and comment on what's going on. And I think whichever candidate wins in November, because it looks, at least now, that it's going to be President Biden versus former President Trump. If that's the case, my prediction is after the election, whichever one wins, there's going to be a spike in illegal immigration. Because if Trump wins, then the smugglers and the prospective illegal aliens are going to say, look, we got to get in before January 20th because the bad orange man is going to lock things down then. And so there's going to be a rush to get in, kind of like before the end of Title 42 back in May. And if President Biden wins re-election, there's, you know, it's going to be four more years of come on in. And so there's going to be a sort of feeling that, look, we got to get in. So anyway, that's my other prediction is that after November, I think it's fifth is when the election is going to be. But after the November election, illegal immigration will spike even more than it has already spiked. So that's it for our 2023 retrospective. Thank you, Todd, and thank you, John, for your you. uh, comments. And we will, uh, obviously, this is recorded, so we're going to hold ourselves all to it, and we'll either give ourselves a pat on the back or a kick in the behind, depending on whether we're right or wrong. I haven't mastered the skill of making predictions that basically couldn't be disproven. You know what I mean? So I'll try to work on that this coming year. And thank you, uh, listeners. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. And um, let's hope that 2024, in an immigration sense, turns out to be better than 2023 was. That's it for this week for Parsing Immigration Policy. And I hope you tune in next week.